Suspicious Votes, a Holocaust survivor singing for Germany, the birth of a Eurovision icon and the most un-Eurovision-y Eurovision ever. Let's talk about Eurovision 1956. 11 years after the biggest conflict that Europe had ever seen, an event of cultural, political, and sometimes, I'm told, even musical significance, was born on a Thursday evening in May at the shores of Lake Lugano in Switzerland. The man who had thought up this event was Marcel Besançon, and he wanted to unite the peoples of Europe after these very difficult times through a musical competition. This competition was modeled after the San Remo Festival, which had been a big success in Italy since 1951. He probably wouldn't have imagined that even 69 years later, this event would still be going strong. The European Broadcasting Union, which Mr. Besançon was, what luck, the president of, decided to organized this first edition and every edition after that to varying success. We are in May 1956, Lago Lugano in Switzerland, and seven countries have decided to participate in this new event. They are apart from the whole Switzerland, Germany, France, Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, and tiny Luxembourg. These are incidentally also the countries that would be founding what today is the European Union just a year later with the Rumen Treaty. Maybe they got the idea in Lugano, who knows. It is therefore also not surprising which very important cultural and political nation of Europe was not present, and that's the United Kingdom. Channeling later Terry Wogan commentary, the BBC decided that they were more interested in their own music festival and that songs in strange languages performed by wailing women and over-emotional southern European men would not be interesting to the British public. How right they were and wrong at the same time. So no Brits, no Nordics, no Eastern Europe. And as each country chose to sing in their own language, there was not a single entry in English. Dancing was also not allowed and bands were not allowed. So you had to be a solo artist singing on stage. One man, Loingrin Filipello, hosted the evening and until today he's the only solo male to host a Eurovision. So yeah, I don't think that Besançon would have ever imagined Verka Serduczka. <laughs> or Lordi, because I think 1956 did not look kindly on men in silver costumes jumping on a stage, or actual real monsters, probably. Savadov Sobral would probably have been fine with the musical selection, but that's on him. So Eurovision was not very Eurovision-y yet. To sufficiently fill the evening without Lordi, Verka Serduczka and only seven countries taking part, each country was allowed to bring two songs. Some of them chose the same artist for both songs, some brought two artists with them. The music was very solemn and maybe modern listeners would say quite boring. But it was actually quite Eurovision-y and that current music trends had no place on the Eurovision stage. As Petra Mede says, when Eurovision is contemporary, it's usually 20 years too late. The first song ever performed on a Eurovision stage was the Vogels van Holland. As you can see from the title, it was from the Netherlands. And now that you know everything that you need to know about this song, Let's talk about the interesting entries of the evening. And these are the two entries from Germany. And I'm not just saying that because I'm from Germany. Trust me, they were actually the most interesting of the pack. The first German entry is Walter Andreas Schwarz. And he was born in 1913 into a Jewish family. During the Nazi regime, his family was deported to a concentration camp. His parents unfortunately died. He only survived, apparently because one of his old school friends was a guard at the camp and helped him survive. After the war, he decided to stay in Germany and he became an ardent critic of the suppression of the remembrance of the Holocaust in 1950s Germany. 
In his song, he actually sings, and they built at the cave of the past a waiting hall for the great happiness with walls made from dreams against reality because they did not like it. Very deep song and very interesting that he was allowed to represent Germany at that time. Apart from the winner, the other positions were not revealed, but rumor has it that this song actually came second and it would have been a good winner, the best winner of this year, in my opinion. The other German song was by Freddy Quinn and was a boogie woogie song about having a new partner every night. So quite a contrast and very much modern for the period. One of the Belgian songs, Monsieur le Noyer de la Seine, has the narrator vying with the drowned people of the Seine to let him join them because life has not been kind to him. Messieurs les noyés de la Seine, ouvrez-moi les portes de l'eau. Je suis fatigué d'user mes semaines. So yeah, that's a song about suicide at Eurovision. Imagine that. Okay, we have now reached a point in the video where I can no longer avoid talking about the winner, the first winner of Eurovision. The voting was quite different and not just because Greece and Cyprus were not there yet to exchange 12 points, but also because each country could vote for itself. Imagine what a boring 12 points that would be nowadays, even though would Cyprus still give 12 points to Greece or would 12 points from Cyprus go to Cyprus? We will never know, I guess. Anyway, each country sent two jurors to Lugano to decide the points for their country. Each country? No. A tiny country near Gaul didn't play by the rules, supposedly because of financial issues. Really, Luxembourg? Aren't you the one with all the banks? They decided that Switzerland, neutral and internationally recognized as incapable of corruption, <coughs> sorry, got something in my throat, would have the honor of attributing not only their own points, in which they could vote for themselves, but also the points of tiny Luxembourg. Just so you get it, Switzerland got to vote for themselves, and they also got to vote in the name of Luxembourg. So, who do you think won? It will be incredibly surprising for you to learn that the winner was, drumroll, Switzerland. It was Switzerland. Luz Asia won with the very typical French chanson, Refrain, and Eurovision fans were stuck with her for decades to come as she roamed national finals and Eurovision shows for the rest of her life. Refrain Couleur du ciel, parfum de mes vingt ans. She commonly fails to mention that she forgot some of the words in the reprise, or as she puts it, was just too emotional to continue and had to start again. And as much as I think that Refrain should not have been the winner that year, thank the Lord that the judges, and here I mean the two Swiss guys who got to decide the whole thing, did not choose the other offering that Asia had performed, which was a German song about a carousel so cheesy that my whole body started to cringe when I listened to it on Spotify. And I did that for you, so you don't have to. Thank you. The wind set the tone for the coming years as French would dominate like no other language after it, I think. Um, but Eurovision was well on its way and I will see you for the next edition, 1957. Please like and subscribe and come back for the next video. See you. Bye bye.